We had penalty competitions leading up to the tournament, which meant whoever won the penalty competition effectively were the best five penalty takers. That's how Carragher ended up on the pitch coming on for two or three minutes. How can Jamie Carragher be taking a penalty in the old? It's a respectful thing to want Scotland to lose. You, surely you have more respect for it. <laughs> 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 Isn't it? Is that, is that crazy thing to say? This is a guy well, that wanted Manchester City to beat his team a few weeks ago, so that basically... Yeah, hold on. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the press had photographers taking pictures and filming us practicing our penalties and they were printing it in the newspaper the next day. What way every player was going. Iceland was devastating. I think about that game probably more than any other game. We've got a lot of players who've learned a similar age. So they'll have more in common, like I didn't have anything in common with, but still don't. <laughs> <laughs> to be so welcome to the Euros fan debate, and this is the bit where the tables are turned and the fans ask us the questions. So, where are we first? Let's start with... Jim, you're on. <laughs> Gary. At Euro 96, how did the England dressing room react after your 4-1 win over the Netherlands when you found out that your late goal that you conceded knocked Scotland out? Was there any? Did you know what had happened in the pitch? And was there any sympathy? It... it no. <laughs> um, <laughs> it wasn't necessarily at that point, I don't think, our priority thinking about, obviously... You know what had happened to Scotland because it, it's something that just happened during the game, and that's probably as high as it ever got in my England career that night. It was something really special. But then when we did find out that um, Scotland had been knocked out as a result of that goal, it was like, a little bit like the cherry uh -huh. on, the, on, on the icing on the cake. <laughs> no, I mean I, I, to be honest, with you, like like uh, Waz said before, actually I, I never went into a tournament unless we were playing Scotland, obviously which we were in that one. Yeah thinking that I wanted Scotland to lose. You know, I, I, I would want Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland. I know there is an arrogance about England or is there a sort of perceived arrogance about England. But does anybody here want Scotland to go out of the group that's an England fan? On you know, Does, it, does anybody want Germany to beat I wouldn't Scotland? mind, I wouldn't mind. You don't want them there? I don't mind if they go out, yeah. I'll, I'll... <laughs> It's, there is a rivalry and it's important. Absolutely. So, yeah, I do want them to go out. You, you talk about rivalry. I, I, I honestly do feel it is a little bit, a, a, not a one way rivalry, but I do think it's heavily sort of swayed from sort of, if you like. Yeah, it's they, a little, want to, they want to beat us more. It's than, a little bit like oh, Bolton fans hate yeah. Manchester yeah, United. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's but important. Man, it's a yeah. respectful thing to want South Scotland to lose. Mm. You, surely you have more respect for <laughs> it. <laughs> isn't it? Is that, is that a crazy thing to say? It's more, I'm being more respectful to no, you as Scottish fans. It's a rivalry. It's a rivalry. Yeah. It's a rivalry. So, I know, Club I'm rivalry, wondering. country rivalry. It's a, it's but just to go fans hope. want United to lose, vice versa. Wait, is it patronising to hear this England is a guy, fans, oh, we want you to do well? Ah, this is a guy well, that wanted Manchester City to beat his team a few weeks ago, so that Good basically... Yeah, yeah. Hold on, cheers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> as long as they don't do better than us. I'm yeah. happy. But, but yeah. when you say, I mean, you say rivalry, I mean, I know that traditional England Scotland rivalry, but going to matches, for me, the one team that I always want to beat is Argentina. Yeah. So every yeah. game that we've played them has been an absolute banger that you've been there. On the terraces, you know, the matches, 98 in, in San Etienne, the one up in Sapporo is probably one of the best games that I've ever yeah. been to. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, rivalry, yes, but. Yeah. There's, there's a real rivalry. I, I, for me, it was always just Germany, just because of what happened in Euro 96 and just generally just throughout our childhoods in terms of what happened. And I think when England beat Germany in Euro 2020, I, I, that obviously um, Gareth obviously was the manager. To me, that's a, that's a big thing, that. Yeah. You know, to beat Germany, I think, is an ultimate in terms of... Because we've always fallen short against them in my mind. So for me, Germany would be, I think, England's big rival. The 5-1 was brilliant. But then? The 5-1 oh, was oh, awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I, had, I had bad results. I, the 5-1 one, one was amazing, but then the Kevin Keegan game, which was the 1-0 last ever game at Wembley yeah. when Kevin yeah. retired after the game, was, you know... The Lampard goal as well, aren't they? Yeah, and the Lampard goal in 2010. You've then got them... I think they beat us in two, Euro 2000, didn't yeah. they? And we yeah. went out. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, you, they just... No, we beat Euro 96... Eh? We beat them in two. Oh, we beat them. Two, we we beat them. We went out the group. But we beat them. Sorry, that was the first right. time we beat them. Yeah, we and did. After that, we felt actually. I think yeah. that, that rivalry thing kind of dissipated a little bit because we'd beaten them for once. Yeah, <laughs> but we've had some good and bad memories against them. I just feel like the Euro '96 will never really probably leave me in terms of thinking of them as the biggest. Who do you think England's biggest rival is when you think of England? Like, who do you want to beat most? Probably Germany. Yeah. I think. I think. Probably if, Germany. Yeah. But just because of my experiences, 
I would say Portugal as well. But, yeah, I was thinking whether you would say Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You think about his experiences against Portugal. You think about yeah, no, I, I think just in terms of obviously broke me foot in 2004. He beat us, got sent off in 2006. He beat us on penalties both at them times. So for me, yeah. I'd love, to see England, I'd love to see England beat Portugal in the final. You know Ronaldo after he did the wink? After, did, what, did, what, when the first time you met him after that, was there any frostiness? Did you think you're... No, um, I, I think you was as well. We, we were trying to get him booked for diving. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, if I could get Ronaldo sent off... So just part of the game? Yeah, 100% yeah. to Woods. And I spoke to him in the tunnel after the game. Um, he said, forgot about wished him good luck for the rest of the tournament. And then it was after that, I think... Um, Sir Alex um, called me up. Um, do, you to remember, see do you remember I was in the office with you? Yeah, Sir Alex called me up um, to make sure I was okay, which I was fine. Um, I think Ronaldo was a bit, bit scared. I, think. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was fine, I had no issue. Yeah, there's no, there's no carryover after stuff like that. Especially. Right, next question, who we got? Dan, you're on. Um, Wayne, what was Gary like as a coach at Euro 2016? <laughs> oh, and Gary, man. what was Wayne like as a player at Euro 2016? Shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, do you know what? He was good, and I think because I was captain as well, we had to. Uh, I was involved a lot in what they were, Roy and Gary wanted. Um, so that was a good experience for me from that point of view. Um, and obviously playing with guys for, for so many years. I think, and we. Agreed and disagreed on things, didn't we? And which is fine, is normal. And I think the one thing which Gaz brought in was really good was the players doing their own meetings and taking ownership. I felt that helped um, the young players a lot um, because what we do, we go in and so as a group of forwards, we go into into a meeting and because um, if we just have a, a team meeting, take the whole team is here, no one would speak. Players don't want to speak out and. So we do smaller meetings with just the players in, no staff. And then you get players all of a sudden start to talk, getting a bit more comfortable talking. Um, and then tactically on the pitch, we're working on how, however we thought we'd win the game. But um, yeah, he, he was OK. To, to be honest with you, at that point, I mean, I was doing the meetings with the players. I was doing the analysis, basically. So Roy and Ray were doing the coaching. Um, and I just had this thing about sort of like, we were, you're doing team meetings and basically it's like you speak, it's like lectures at probably university where you've got like these 100 people sat in front of you or 25 players and you're just talking at them and there's no feedback and you have no idea. They just walk out and you think, about, well, did any of that sink in? Just that it broke them down into units and actually I would be in there and just, sh and they start to do it themselves and I actually believed in it quite a lot. Not necessarily that it brought any success, it obviously didn't in the great thing and neither would any meeting, but I just, I believed it in terms of just generally a leadership style, to be fair, of, of having people speak back um, and hearing what they were saying and how, how we were playing. But it, it, like I say, you don't get the results sometimes and we're obviously getting beat by Iceland. I was, I was, I, just a bit wiser, but all of the players, you know, there wasn't this idea that, and, and Roy would say the same if we were here now. We would never ever say, oh, play, you'll have, play. sometimes you feel as a coach and you'll have this where you think players have let you down or you think that players haven't given their all or you think they were, they're having us over. We never thought that in any point in the four years. You know, this idea that lads don't care about playing for England, we, we knew they cared about playing for England. That sometimes maybe didn't come across. It maybe sometimes when we went out against Iceland, people think that, you know, you think about the fans who've travelled over, spent all that money, thousands of pounds, they've sacrificed their summer made those choices and the players are absolutely devastated. They're absolutely yeah. devastated. If you see it, honestly, on a daily basis, the work which obviously the staff, the players are putting in and trying to break down the opposition, trying to analyse opposition, then players in, in the training, the recovery, everything, you're doing everything you can to try and win. And that moment when you get knocked out in the dressing room, it's, it's horrible, it's the worst feeling you can have. It doesn't make sense, does it? If you, if you just think logically, does anybody does anybody think, let's use this current group of England players, does anybody think that they're enjoying and looking forward to being criticised for going out early? <laughs> doesn't make sense, does it? So this idea that, you know, ultimately, they are human beings, and we, we, we can say this before a tournament, but you know in the heat in the next few weeks, a big country will go out of the group and there'll be all this pile on towards them. It's just going to happen. And look, there should be criticism, there's no doubt about that. But don't, please separate the criticism which is due from the fact that the players don't, they say that players don't care, they run this much money. That is, the tr that is what you will hear. Honestly, I've never, in my experience, and I think to be fair, you know, 
I, I'm looking at a player here who, to be fair, died on the pitch every single week when he played football. He did literally did. He would give his all every every. But he towards the end, we lost games. We we went out of tournaments and we made mistakes maybe at times. But there was never lack of care or lack of sort of effort. It, it was never down to that. Sometimes lack of quality. Maybe sometimes you know wrong choices that you could argue on the pitch. Maybe sometimes team selection wasn't great in t in tournaments gone by that you think we could have picked different players. But there's this care bit. I, I don't know many football players that don't care. Usually, when a football player looks like he doesn't care, there's usually something a lot deeper going on in their lives or with themselves. That's that's usually my experience of players because they're usually good kids growing up that really are desperate to play football well. And you know, obviously he was he, he was he was a dream to to, to work with, and the, but the rest of them were as well. Every single one of them, and Iceland was devastating. It, it's the one game of football that I've watched in my life where I still to this day I, I think I, I think about that game probably more than any other game that I think about. And I, I, you know, all the great games or all the big defeats for United, but going out of tournaments with England, that was for the, me. That was that the was one the game. That was the one game for me where with 25 minutes left. I knew we weren't going to score. It, it felt like and, watching it as well. Oh no, it, it was like it. So I knew we weren't going to yeah. score, and that's why I'm concerned with the England squad now because what happened. In, I'm not. I'm not blaming them. You think they're going to feel like that? <laughs> but no. But what happened is we brought a lot of attacking players onto the pitch, and we lost our shape. We lost our discipline. Oh, yeah. um, we we were rushing things. We weren't. One of the things we we used to do at Manchester United is we used to stay patient right up until the 90th minute. And, we keep doing the right things and in this England game against Iceland, we, with 25 minutes to go, we just lost all our shape, discipline, lost everything. I was in the middle of the pitch, I was in midfield at the time and I was there, with, I looked up the clock, 25 minutes left, I was thinking, we're going to go out here, we're not going to score. And that's the only time I've ever had that. What, did it feel like, a, like it, just, it was falling apart? You, yeah, it was like, I, I was watching all, I think there was Vardy, I think there was Sturridge, um, Wiltshire, come on, was playing higher than me in midfield. Um, Danny Rose on the left, can't remember who was on the right. But there was just so many attacking players. And then when Iceland would break, I'm in the middle and I could see it. I'm thinking, we're in trouble here, we're not going to score. Yeah. And that was, I had that feeling for 25 minutes. It does sometimes like just fall apart around you sometimes in, the, in, a, in a game of football. And, and for England, I mean, more often than not, I went out on penalties. I think I went out on penalties four or five times, two to Portugal. One to Germany, Germany in in um, ninety six. Ninety six. One to Italy in two th with Roy yeah. um, in the first tournament two thousand twelve. And I thought it was one more. Argentina. Argentina ninety eight. Argentina ninety eight. So five out of eight tournaments I went out on penalties. So the two big things for me were basically penalties. Mm. Uh, how that? I mean, I, we won one penalty shootout in my time um, as a as a player in a. Cup. But when when you were talking about the media before I remember this was in um, it was in Brazil yeah when we were practicing penalties um, the day before the game and the, the press had photographers taking pictures and filming us practicing our penalties and they were printing it in the newspaper the next day what way every player was going so we and then like, they're the first ones though to come straight on top of you and say that you you were shit yeah no so we were like we, got you got? we were like what are you doing yeah why are you your own, when your own media is going against yeah, so, um, you, absolutely zero And it was chance. like, well, if, if I don't print it, someone else will print it. And it's like, what's <laughs> yeah. the Just be the bigger person. <laughs> you know, you just I, be, I just support your nature. I just remembered that actually, that was, I, I, I actually, to be fair, at the time snapped at that because there was a little room in the, it was basically a closed session and we were doing practicing penalties and the, I can't remember who the journalists were, two journalists that basically snuck into a little room, like a peephole type thing that looked, it wasn't me, but no, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't you, but I, can't, I, I, I will know who it was. And I was absolutely, I couldn't believe it really that it had happened. I do remember that now. And look, that, that's, that, that's probably a, a, a rare incident, but with penalties, we tried everything. And actually somebody told me the other week about what Gareth does. I think Gareth takes three players. Um, it was Anthony Gordon, I think, or someone told me how he does it. And he takes three players to a very quiet area of the training ground. They take three penalties each. They do it in a real sort of methodical way, quite short, but quite sort of concentrated and focused. And basically, they're told to pick a place where they're going to take a penalty, and then they go in. So we tried all sorts of different things, never quite to that. So we had, we had penalty competitions. 
leading up to the tournament, which meant whoever won the penalty competition effectively were the best five penalty takers. That was Sven in 2006, that I think, in Germany. Because that's how Carragher ended up on the pitch, coming on for two or three minutes. Because he actually won the penalty competition of all these penalties <laughs> that we would take. How time... can Jamie Carragher be taking a penalty in the shoes house? That is, I asked that question myself, you know what I mean? But The only thing I will say is John Terry was one of the best penalty takers I've ever seen. Yeah. Honestly, in training. And so when I went off the pitch in the Champions League final. And I'm, I'm looking at him because I'd seen him in training with England. I'm watching him walking up and I'm thinking, it's over. <laughs> um, so <laughs> thankfully he slipped. But <laughs> it's, it's, I've, I practice penalties where I tell the goalkeeper what way I'm going and do it properly. But... It does frustrate you when players come up and try and mess around. I say to my players now, if you're practising, do it properly how you do it in the game. And it's, you can do as much practice what you can put in places, the, the stadium, the fans, pressure. The, the pressure of it. Obviously, it's completely different when you, you're stepping up to what it is on a training pitch. Yeah, and I, and I think when you lose five out of eight tournaments or you go out of five out of eight tournaments on penalties, it becomes more than just luck. We rec I recognise now, looking back, we used to go out and think, oh, it's, you know, it's penalties is a 50-50. It's not, you know, it really isn't. You've got to have really good technical players on the pitch. The work, what goes, the detail goes into penalties, taking penalties and, and the goalkeepers on studying. There's so much work that goes into it now. Neve, next question. Yeah, for both of you, how many of the current England team would get into the Golden Generation team? I think there's only one of the defence, which would be Kyle Walker, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> no, I'm really, I'm really I'd obviously be right centre back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't, for me, I, I, said, I had said this last week, I said, for me, none of the defenders would. I think. If you look back, you had Rio Ferdinand, John Terry, Saul Campbell, Campbell Ledley King, Cara, Gaz, Ash Cole. For me, none of the defenders would. In, in the attacking areas, I think that's where a few would, few would get in. I think Harry Kane, 100% would be in. Um, Foden would be in Bellingham, maybe. So I think for the, again, the back line wouldn't. We, we, our, well. our problem position actually was left side. Obviously, that's where Paul Scholes ended up. So there's no doubt that one of these players here would end up on our left side. Um, the balance of our midfield, obviously, with Lampard and Gerrard, would probably mean that you think, you'd have to think that Declan Rice would, prob would come into that. I mean, you know, I, Lampard and Gerrard are amazing players. Um, I, think, I, was I, I think this last I, week. I think, I think Harry Kane and, and, and Michael Owen was a great player, but Harry Kane would start up top with you with respect. I mean, I Harry Kane would play. But I said Harry Kane last week. For me, you, Harry Kane's England's best ever player. Yeah. So Kane, Kane, I think. Kane comes in. I think Declan Rice comes in. Um, I think you definitely could put Kyle at right back in front of me with, and, and, and legitimately say that he would be better than me there. I think to be fair, you'd probably argue Jordan with what he's done now at getting goal. You know, obviously, I mean, I mean J Mo did well for us. Paul Robinson did well. Oh for no. Us. Pickford, sorry, so would Pick, definitely Pick, be in, yeah. Pickford, I think now, I, and I was anti-Pickford's the wrong phrase. I was, I was n not convinced by him. I'll be honest with you. Three, four years. For well. me, I, I played with Jordan at Everton, and my concern was, is he gets seriousness. A bit, he gets a bit agitated. Joe Hart was the same. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ramsdale, Ramsdale is the same. Where it's a goalkeeper get, thing, though, isn't it? Yeah, to get a bit oh. agitated and. Um, Jordan was like that. And I, was, composed, I went from playing with Edwin van der Sar, who was the calmest man ever, <laughs> to Jordan Pickford, who was like, yeah. a bit, so I was like, I, I weren't really sure, but then obviously the way his career's gone, he's been brilliant, especially I, for England. I'm instinctively was, 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 was nervous about the fact that I saw him laughing on the pitch as a goalkeeper at times, which I thought, I, I, I don't see a goalkeeper laughing. Yeah. Um, it just lacked seriousness. And I thought actually temperament, composure, and stature probably as well, physical stature was probably... And then when I've seen him, to be fair, in this last three or four years, and actually I don't think I've ever... There's only one goal that I think I've seen him concede in a tournament for England where I thought he should have saved that, and you probably might name another. And it was actually in a game against Belgium. Um, it was a meaningless game, I think, where actually we lost and we ended up getting an easier uh, route through to the semi-final. But I don't think he makes a lot of mistakes for England <laughs> at all. His kicking's pretty good. I think that he's... 
Um, is, he, I think he's become a big player for England and he's actually surprised me and he's better for Everton than I thought he would be in the Premier League. So for me, he's turned it round for me from where I was in my mind. So Pickford comes in, Walker comes in, Rice comes in, I think Kane comes in and I would put Foden on the left, to be fair as well. Um, I, would have Beck, I would have Beckham still in the team. Uh, I would have, obviously, Waza still in the team and I would have Gerard, I'm, I'm not. Gerard I'm not sure team. just yet. I'd have that many in. Five I'd have in. On the topic of like former players, I'm always really fascinated by the humanistic side of like uh, international major tournaments, and something Italy have done because they've got a really inexperienced side this Euro, and something that Spalletti's done is he's invited five creative players from over the decades of, of Italy, players like Antonioni, Totti, Baggio, okay. uh, players like that. He's invited them along to basically chat with the current lot. And it's in the hope of elevating a little bit of spark, a little bit of creativity. If England were to do that, do you think that the culture of England and the way we are, it would have the same benefit as it would to a nation I, like I th Italy and which players as well? I think Gareth has done that. It's right. Not five players to, to that extent, but like I've, I've been in and spoke with, not this time, but spoke with players and I know other former players have, have been in as well. So I think Gareth does that in a different way, but... What is it that you do when you go? What do you, is it? Do you just chat with them? Is it about? Yeah, you can talk about your, your experiences of, of the tournament, basically of obviously games. They are what they are, but you can talk about how how it is around the hotel, how the media is works and stuff like that. You can go back to your experiences of things you felt and and try and give the best advice and things, obviously, which maybe you didn't do so well as a player to try and help them not not do that themselves or so just giving them advice you can really. I, I think one of the big things is for a tournament is particularly if you're going to go to the latter stages is for young players to preserve their energy emotionally because you imagine if you start winning the build-up of sort of you know the media attention the family the feeling and young young people 18 19 20 year olds they want to train but then they want to be playing on their FIFA then they want to be doing table tennis then they want to have a, they never stop and they're just constantly, and I always say to young players when I sort of speak to them about a tournament, just remember you will hit a wall at some point. That you're talking about that experience in the dressing room and that experience in the That was at, me in, in 2004, the wasn't it? it I, I remember in 2004, he would literally be on the tennis court, he'd be on the table tennis court, he'd be in, we used to have an arcade type thing where, they, and he, he was non-stop anyway, that's his sort of nature. I was, I, just calm the fuck down, will you? You know what I mean? You, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'd, like, leave me, I'd leave my bedroom, uh, like, 7.30 in the morning to have breakfast, then um, we get ready to go training. I don't think I'd go back to my bedroom till like 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. No. <sighs> I'd finish training, I'd go um, get a shower, go for lunch. Like a Duracell bunny. And then <laughs> I'd be playing snooker, yeah. I'd go in the massage room, um, <laughs> put a movie on. Um, I just wouldn't go to my room, I just wanted to. And, and all these used to get pissed off because I'd annoy them. Basically Do you think that needs to be instilled into Bellingham then? <laughs> Do you think, think that he needs to be kind of, because maybe we were talking about that, perhaps there's a bit of burnout he there. Looks, he, looks like quite, to... he looks switched on though and looks quite controlled and calm, but you're right, he will need someone who will just, I mean, look, I don't, he's not got the same personality as you have in terms of sort of the how, you know, he was really like hyper around the place and was like best mates with everybody, everybody got on with him. So he could go, there's a group over there playing FIFA, he'd be in the middle of them. There's a group over there playing snooker, right, who am I playing that? It, that, that was him. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure when I look at Bellingham, he looks to me to be that tight. He may be. And if he is, he would need to calm down because t emotionally and mentally is where this... I think what, I think what the, this group now have got is, they've got a, as I said before, a lot of players around a similar age. So they'll have more in common. Like, I didn't have anything in common with... Well, still don't. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. With, with Gaz. So... so but the players, different players... <laughs> Um, I had to go and find out like, what the light were. I think now the players will have a lot in common because they're all round in the round the same age, the similar age. Do, do you know what? I'm, I'm, I, look, the, back in the day, it wasn't FIFA. It was card schools. Mm -hmm. Now it's FIFA. And the, the, the sort of... You, you, it, was, it was actually when we were coaches. I'm really concerned about it, actually. If you stare at a screen for hours, your, your mind and your head just becomes absolutely sort of like, you know... I, I don't know. I, I don't know how a player that's concentrating on football that's trying to rest. I think that's just where they need to be careful now. Honestly, I, I've got a real fear around young people just generally spending hours on these <coughs> games. No, but um, it's not that. It's the stream. I've seen um, Pickford and Ramsdale were streaming on with 
some of these streamers Honestly. Last, last week and one wrong word while you're away with England in that camp. I think yeah. I think they need to be really careful. Yeah. I, I done it a few weeks ago with a group of lads. I just done it messing around for a bit of fun. But if they're away with England and they start doing that and they say the wrong thing at the wrong time. Um, we, we've got to remember they're young, they're active, they get bored quickly in a hotel for a month where they can't go out of the hotel grounds because you've got security all around you. So the card school was back in my day and I, I, thought, it was a, I thought it was a devastating impact on morale, on mindset, because obviously, you know, just generally, it was just devastating. The lads were just playing all the time. And then you're talking about, obviously, now FIFA, that's the new sort of, if you like, collective. And it's just because lads are bored, young lads are bored. And I do think there needs to be some sort I mean, Gareth, I'm sure, will be across it. There does need to be some sort of like control over it because that's where you do just can have these things can have a big impact, I think. Right, Steve, next question. This is to both of you. Who did you room with for international tournaments and who was the worst roommate in the squad? We didn't have room we, because I, we I've never. I, I, the only time I roomed was in the states. I was always in my own room. Well, every player was in their own room. It was from my time. They've killed me with this question. No, so I. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 so I, I famously root was rooming in the in ninety five. Sorry, ninety six. We were still rooming. Um, so I roomed with Phil because he was the only other United player. Is there anyone that was mad though? Like you'd, you'd hear something like, oh, he was on the landing at such a clock or he's sneaked out or... He's no, I mean, I roomed with Bex, but then stopped rooming with Bex in 96 when he got brought into the squad and I was in the room when he first saw Victoria with uh, the uh, say he'll be there. He'd All been right. told that story, so it's not, not, not a new one. But then I, just incompatible with um, sleep patterns. I, we never, because after that, the recognised sleep was important and that people having their own space was important. So at United and with England, we went to individual rooms. Um, I, I, I'm trying to think of sort of like roommates. I, I, I was cutting off that. I roomed with, um, when I went to DC, I roomed with the captain at the time. He was, he was captain before I got there. Him, but then the first game, he took the armband off and gave it to me. <laughs> so I was in the room. I, was like, I had to sit down and say to him. Like that? Um, <laughs> Under your pillow? So, so, sorry, mate. Um, <laughs> you're no longer <laughs> captain. You have to sleep with one eye open. You have to sleep with one eye open. That was a bit awkward, but... No, um, yeah, I never roomed. I would have... Do you know what? I would really would have loved to have room with him. Just to annoy him. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't have worked, I can assure you. <laughs> Flav, next question. Uh, in the quarter-final penalty shootout defeat to Portugal in 2004, what number did you put yourself down as, Gary? Num placement. What number was that? Who was, who, who was, who was the top? Well, I wasn't in the top five, obviously. Then Vassell went, didn't he? I think I was seven or eight. Maybe eight, maybe. <laughs> um, Wayne, if you wasn't in, injured, what, what would you put yourself down as? I always, in shootouts, I always, I liked one number one, but it depends on... The players who were there, so I obviously went the first choice penalty taker. There was Bex. Um, with loads, by the way. Mike Lowen. I don't get players who go number five. The, the, like I seen Salah, Salah, I think with Egypt on it. Um, the, like the penalty takers, the, doing it to try and get the glory of winning the game. I don't get it. it might never get here. So is weird. it just for, from in terms of quality penalty takers, one to five? Is that the, the best way to do it? The best. Start? For me, you 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 have your best penalty taker number one, your second yes. number two. And, and so on, where you might never get to number five. Yeah. So it, for me, it doesn't make sense. And if you start, well, if you start your penalty, well, and they miss, you've always got a better chance. Have you done well in penalty shootouts? Obviously, yeah, rock. Italy against Buffon, yeah. Top corner. <laughs> 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 One um, more question, John, in the band. Uh, so, yeah, obviously we played the music at the England Games. Uh, are there any particular chants you, you liked, you disliked, you remembered? Or, if I can broaden it a bit, best atmospheres that you've played in? I was, I was thinking particularly when I saw it at Shawa, I think it was when the stand was actually vibrating and the, the, the floodlights were bouncing because the, the fans were singing yeah. so loud, it was all shaking. The <sighs> best atmosphere I've played in with England. Definitely where it was Algeria. Definitely where that one. <laughs> um, no, for me, I love the atmosphere, like I go back to it, it was obviously my best, but I think in the stadium light in Portugal for me was the best atmosphere for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd probably say that Wembley, Euro 96, Scotland, Holland games. Mm, yeah. um, 
Yeah, I, I, I Is that don't. Because we weren't playing then, Gary. <laughs> 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 Do you get access into every? Will you get access into every stadium? In Everyone, yeah, because yeah. we've got the caps. Because we've not, we've not missed for like twenty-eight years. But in terms of sort of so like, if you the walk around with a drum, you just get free tickets. No, we don't get. You free would. Tickets. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do, we've, we've done the caps, you know, like the other fans. So we've got the caps that qualify us for the tickets. So we we yeah. buy them same as everybody else for the away games and stuff and tournaments and that. But from a point of view of actually, you know, are there, are there some, are there some oh, countries yeah. that actually sort of stop you playing? Yeah, oh, wow. yeah, we had uh, Ukraine, they stopped us and they put us on uh, their news bulletin. So we, had to, we were live on their news bulletin with translators in our ears in, in the studio uh, because they'd stopped us going in the tournament right. and it was a big national disgrace. <laughs> so then next time, straight in, no problem. But you, if you meet the jobs worth, then you've got, you've got a problem. But we've always got accreditation or... You know, they've, they've cleared it before, wherever we go. What we purpose. You meet the jobs worth it, as, as you've probably seen yourself. Yeah. Right, paddles. Have you got paddles up? These are, right. England will win the Euros. Oh, there's a lot of red. There's a lot of red. Steve Clark has achieved more with Scotland than Gareth Southgate has with England. Just me. You win the same amount. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's prospective. Harry Kane will win the golden boot. 100%. Yeah. Will he? Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I um, that. Yeah, no, he's got a chance, hasn't he? He's got... Have you got a yellow paddle that says, I hope so? <laughs> um, this, this will be Gareth Southgate's last tournament as an England manager. Oh, there's a lot oh, agreeing so with that. I actually think it could be as well. Wazza, where are you at with it? I'm pretty sure it will be. Um... Right, Scotland will qualify from their group. Oh, mixed bag. Yeah, pretty mixed, I'd say. Would Wayne Rooney get in this current England side? Oh, Ooh, he turned it around quickly. <laughs> 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 no. Not as he is. <laughs> Yes. That would be our fucked if I get in like this. Can <laughs> <laughs> oh, you play left back? <laughs> Scotland have better fans than England. <laughs> Fuck off, Red Bag. <laughs> I, I thought there was, I mean, I think Scotland fans are pretty good, but I think England yeah. fans are pretty I think both are pretty good, to be fair. That is the end of the Euros debate 2024 and I wish all of you the very best for the summer and for those of you who are going to the tournament, stay safe and have an amazing time.